he probably does not remember it, but I first met uh, Vinod having uh, dinner together at one of Esther's uh, functions. Certainly an inspiration to us. And uh, I had been aware of him, of course, long before that. Uh, I've always been interested in, in him because he acts as a, as a bit of a, what you might call a black sheep. With, in a world of VCs where uh, they seem to act like white sheep all the time, uh, this is a fellow who uh, thinks for himself. And uh, he's taken plenty of arrows for doing it. But if you're in the VC business, you know it's kind of there are leaders and there are followers. And uh, even within the group that are leaders, there are leaders and there are followers. Uh, Vinod has the obvious technical background, both in terms of education and in terms of companies, that qualifies him for what he's doing today. And the fact that he was uh, arguably the first person in the valley to, to come to a complete understanding of of the need for a rapid response and for how to make it happen. Today, there isn't a VC anywhere in the world that I can think of that doesn't have alternative and clean energy on its list on the website somewhere. But uh, this is the guy who, who did it first. So uh, with nothing else important uh, that matters, really. Uh, thank you for coming to see us. And please help us figure this all out. Good evening. Ah. So uh, Mark t talked about optimism. I'm an optimist. Uh, I have always been an optimist. I'm not sure why the format isn't right, but thanks, for my, thanks to Microsoft for that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they always manage to screw me up somehow. <laughs> um, you know, before you're an optimist, you have to do one important thing, which is get rid of the past. And I want to talk first about forecasting. We are, in fact, facing a very large opportunity. Some people think of it as a big problem. I think of it as a big opportunity. And to me, every problem is an opportunity if you solve it. But there are too many pundits, too many prognosticators, too many forecasters. And my favorite ones in the energy business, and I was mostly asked to talk about energy and where it's going. Um, I believe they're all wrong and very wrong. And the reason's simple. These are economists, and they use econometrics. And what we are fundamentally facing is a battle between economists and econometrics and innovators in science and technology. Because science and technology and innovation invalidates most of the assumptions the pundits rely on to make their models. So Mark said I was a black sheep. I actually believe in a new model. How many people have read a book called The Black Swan? Yeah. I believe that is the way the world op operates. I'm a convert. And I also believe I'm wrong, in addition to everybody else. The only thing we can count on is predictable unpredictability. Uh, let me prove it to you, and then I'll, I'll explain why. This was. In 1985, the difference between the forecast and the actual price of oil, five years out, and by the way, in 1985, 10 years out. They did this again in 1990, uh, 1990 five years out and 10 years out, 95. Now, why is a forecast like this valuable? Why do we keep looking at these forecasts? Isn't it much better to realize we can't forecast and pre prepare for unpredictability than, pre than rely on forecasts? By the way, gas, forecast, gas price forecasts look the same. 
and surprisingly, I won't show it, but coal forecasts look the same. You'd think coal is a very predictable commodity. And Aristotle figured this out 300 BC. You can't look for precision more than the subject allows. Um, let me give you another example that explains what happens. In 1984, Fortune magazine, and again, my format's messed up. I apologize. Forecast for 1989, 1 million phones. They were, in fact, 3.5 million, or a 70% a year error. This was my favorite forecast of all times. In 1980, McKinsey, very expensive study for AT&T, forecast that by the year 2000, they will be under a million phones. They were actually 109 million phones. And by the way, AT&T did, based on this forecast, divest their cellular business. <laughs> now, I can go on, but the reason for this is very important. What was McKinsey's mistake? This was the cell phone in 1980, for those of you who remember it. And if you were forecasting 109 million of these, you'd be wrong. The phone in 2000 was smaller than the handset cord in the phone of the year 1980. Yes, cellular phones did have handset cords, for those of you who <laughs> didn't use them. And, and it, this, this is the reason I believe this is about economists and econometrics against innovators and innovation. And why forecasting is the wrong thing to do. Alan Kay said, the best way to predict the future is just go invent it. And I'm a true believer in that principle. So I'm going to make some forecasts. <laughs> and I'll probably be wrong, but at least it's everything we are trying to invent today. I'm not basing it on an extrapolation of history which is only valid as long as no assumptions change, and assumptions always change. And those of you who've read The Black Swan will know that. And in fact, I'm probably the only one who thinks oil will be at $35 a barrel by the year 2030. Why? Because basic science and conversion efficiencies and things like that say the marginal cost of producing an alternative to oil will be $35 a barrel sometime in the next 10 years, and that marginal price point will catch up with oil sometime in the next 25 years. Because invention is in progress. So let me move on after hopefully convincing you that forecasting is futile. And by the way, less than 10 years ago, we were struggling with, uh, with whether oil would be $25 a barrel or not. But we forget, technology expands to order the possible. I had this conversation with AT&T 10 years ago, 1996, that all long distance calls would be free and if they were, AT&T wouldn't be in business they didn't believe it, at and is not in business, they were sold for a song, only the brand exists. And it's very easy to make mobile the conventional wisdom of today. Almost certainly the conventional wisdom around energy 20 years from now will be something that's unimaginable, unimaginable today. People have very limited vision. I can't even imagine the head of the patent office. <laughs> but my favorite is George Bernard Shaw. I sort of seem to be a disciple of George Bernard Shaw. All progress depends on the unreasonable man. And the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to enter past those limits. So let's venture past those limits for a moment talk about what if. I know it sounds silly. What if the best way to clean up the air was more coal plants? 
What if more driving meant less carbon emissions? What if cement, instead of being the third largest carbon polluter on the planet, was in fact the most important sequester of carbon dioxide? It takes a million years to produce a cure root from biomass. Nature does it. What if we could do it in minutes, maybe seconds? George Bernard Shaw would surely be happy, and the black swan model would be operative. I'm happy to tell you that we've invested in every one of those possibilities, every single one. And I was too chicken to invest in others that, are, that I know people are doing. And if I had the guts, I would, in fact, invest in those. But surely I'm wrong in some of those. There's huge economic consequences to it. This was a chart I first used in the early 90s. This is, on the left, the market capitalization of all the com companies that didn't use the microprocessor. On the right, all the companies that committed to the microprocessor. You can see what happened. But we do live in a winner-take-all economy. Initially, like today, the solar, uh, solar, for example, looks something like stuff on the left. Most renewable energy does. More companies will be lost than win, but more money will be won than lost. It is the nature of the digital economy, of the economy where winners take greater and greater percentage of what happens. So the other question I often get is, America is a disparate country. Uh, there's all kinds of things. When you look at solar power, that's the solar radiation in this country. But when you look at wind, that's the wind. When you look at biomass, when you look at geothermal, when you look at the agricultural belt, when you look at all of them together, every part of America has something to contribute. And this is why I think we'll end up going to where everybody will be part of this equation. So let me talk about innovation. The most important thing, and there's only a few things that matter. When we talk about climate change, if we solve three or four problems, we are done. We are complicating the problem more than we need to. 75% or more of carbon emissions on this planet come from four sources. The use of coal, the use of oil, the use of uh, the production of cement, and the production of steel. If we solve those problems, we are done. We don't have to get more complex than that. Efficiency, by the way, helps solve those problems, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Unfortunately, most of what the environmental movement talks about is completely irrelevant to climate change. This is alternative energy. I think it's mainstream energy that we are interested in, not alternative energy. So a few comments on existing energy technologies. Nuclear, you've heard it's cheap. It's not. It's surprisingly expensive if it has to pay market rates of capital. At market rates, at the same rate of interest for debt, nuclear is far more expensive than solar power today. It's only because nuclear industry has subsidized federal loan guarantees and 5% interest rates that they get these numbers. Coal. In fact, those of you interested, there's about a 70-page paper I wrote last summer. It's on my website, coastalventures.com. Coal, in fact, we shouldn't be avoiding coal because it's bad. We should be avoiding coal because it's an uneconomic, risk-adjusted bet. I don't have enough time to go through it. But when you take the cost of a new coal plant and add the risk of carbon regulation, it becomes uneconomic. 
Most people know, don't know this, that many more plants were canceled last year, coal plants, than put in place at new plants. It's on its way out. Wind's a good technology, but you can't run the infrastructure on, of society either on wind or on photovoltaics. Imagine if you went to PG&E and said, I'll sign a 20-year power purchase agreement with you, and I'll ship you power when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining. Otherwise, shut off people's NFL games. We have to be realistic about this. We have to make utility-grade power if you're going to compete. So, solar. Photovoltaics are great distributed technology. They work in areas where peak load happens to coincide with peak sun. Air conditioning is a typical example, many parts of the country. But without storage, solar photovoltaics are not a massively scalable technology despite all the interest it gets. And storage is a relatively difficult problem. More importantly, photovoltaics, for those of you who are investors, is a very turbulent market. There's well over 50 good startups, maybe over 100 startups. So almost every assumption you make will be wrong. Um, but the surprise, and in the year 2006, I gave a talk at the Solar Industry Conference and mentioned the word solar thermal. Dumb idea. You know, photovoltaic cell, you pr process them as semiconductor fab, costs a billion dollars, you do this fancy processing and you get 15, 17% efficiency. But if you just collect the sunlight as heat, boil water as steam, and run it in a steam turbine, steam turbines can run at 35 or percent efficiency or more. I sort of first heard this and went, duh. Um, and I talked about it at the 2006 conference, and 95% of the people at the solar industry conference said, what's that? Well, those are the economics. It is cheaper than natural gas today in California. Only assumption here is the same cost of capital for all in all. Now, scalability is an issue. There's no point solving a problem if it can't scale. This is all the land that's needed to supply all the electricity on this planet. Scalability is not an issue. By the way, photovoltaics, Germany was 57% of the worldwide PV market in 2005. That's Germany's solar resource. Here's how it compares to the US in its solar resource. Solar is a silly idea in Germany. It's 57% of the photovoltaics markets. This is where the environmentalists go wrong. Pushing stuff that doesn't make economic sense, it doesn't spread. We want things that are pulled into the market because they're economic, not stuff that's pushed on people because we should. That's all the land area that would be needed to supply all the electric power in the US. One little 100 mile by 100 mile area in Nevada. Oops. Um, Three Gorges Dam, 18 gigawatts of generating capacity, 25 years to plan, $50 billion in estimated cost in current dollars. Solar thermal would have 1.7 times the power in the same area, lower capital costs in a far faster construction time. That's the cost, that's the cost of gas combined cycle and this plots the cost of power versus the price of carbon for gas and nuclear, coal, IGCC, and pulverized coal. I won't go through the details. The top line is gas, CT, used for peaking power, high cost, low capital cost power generation. Within that price range, alternatives to fossil become price competitive with peaking power. That's the power you use in times of peak demand. During base load, depending upon the price of carbon, you have to be in the red region to be competitive. 
And I only believe green technologies will win if they're cheaper than their fossil competitors, unsubsidized. That's where I think the various solar thermal technologies will be. I won't go into the details of this. My personal forecast within the next three years, these will be cheaper for baseload power than almost every baseload technology at zero price of carbon. A high price of carbon will help accelerate the transition. And by the way, most some utilities, the more progressive ones, start, charge time of day pricing. If we do, solar power becomes even more competitive. Let me move from there to biomass, biofuels, hybrids, and stuff like that. First, most of what we talk about is one, uncompetitive, and so not scalable. Two, irrelevant. Three, non-scalable. But there are many non-food technologies. And it's not just ethanol. We, in fact, have four ventures in cellulosic ethanol, but four producing fuels other than ethanol. I do believe in the next five years, we'll get to production costs below $1.25 a gallon. That would retail about $2 a gallon at every Walmart in America with today's margins from biofuels made from non-food crops. In fact, if you use food crops, you're destined to have high prices. It's a high value product as your feedstock. It's the wrong thing to even attempt. But the surprising thing is it'll take little land. I'll get into that in just a second. So, why all this controversy? The one thing to be clear is we can do these things right and we can do them wrong. In fact, Tim Serchinger, who defined this recent science article that got a lot of press, defined a scenario where you tear up rainforests to plant biofuel crops. In fact, it's the wrong thing to do. In fact, just yesterday, Tim Serchinger and I agreed that we had a similar vision for 90% of what we, what we wanted to do. He defined a scenario that was bad. Turns out there's half a dozen other scenarios that are not only better and good, but much more plausible that he chose not to define. So we are actually doing an op-ed together now, because I always go to my enemies um, and say, what are their assumptions? Why do they believe what they believe, and can we fix that? And that's the right way to approach it. So I've actually proposed, most of you know, there's a LEEDS rating for homes, a CLAW rating for carbon emissions, land use, air impact, and water use for all biofuels. And if we do that, there won't be a controversy. But if we don't, we are automatically picking the alternative. When we pick the, you know, we can't say no biofuels without saying we're picking oil. Because when we do, we're picking a whole set of related issues. The energy crisis, the terrorism crisis, the climate crisis, they're all toy tied to oil. So we are making a choice whether we know it or not. So we can do it poorly or sustainably. Now people always say to me, but what are hybrids? They're the right way to go. So I drew up this chart that doesn't have years on it. It depends on what battery technology and hybrid technology does and what cellulosic technologies do. If 100% of the world's transportation power, mobile transportation, comes from some source, it will be split between electric power and liquid fuels. And depending upon the relative rate of progress of these two technologies, we will split between these two. The fact is, if you examine the details of the technologies, it is extremely likely that in the next 20 years, battery technology will make relatively slow progress and cellulosic technology will make relatively rapid progress. So any of these three scenarios are possible. We should allow for both. 
But in fact, it's unlikely that hybrids will amount to much. This is a McKinsey chart that McKinsey did recently, and they didn't do any forecasting, so we can believe them. <laughs> they just did an actual factual analysis of the cost of reducing carbon, a ton of carbon from the air. On the extreme right, and I know it's hard to see, um, on the extreme right, and I think I may have a pointer here, right there is car hybridization. $90 to reduce a ton of carbon dioxide. That's where cellulosic is. Even if we could convince the world to pay extra for hybrids, which is the right technology for society to use. I got in a lot of trouble for uh, a blog I did last year called a Prius Green or Greenwash. But the numbers said everything, and I couldn't find anything wrong with them. In fact, these are the numbers. If you take a Honda Civic Hybrid or a Honda Civic run on cellulosic, these are the carbon emissions per mile driven. You notice a hybrid has much higher emissions for the same car, the Honda Civic, per mile driven than cellulosic. More importantly, we know that if the monthly cost is higher, and it is almost $150 higher per month for the average consumer, because they pay more for the hybrid, they're not gonna buy it. So the question isn't, are hybrids good? Is a Prius good? Prius is selling very well. But I like to say, so are Gucci bags. The question isn't, is the Prius selling well? The real question we have to ask is over the next 15 years, we are going to sell a billion cars on this planet. What low carbon technology can penetrate 500 million to 800 million of those cars? Because if it doesn't, it's just making you feel good. It's irrelevant to the real problem. And that's why I concluded hybrids were never gonna make it. India is going to the $2,500 nano. Imagine adding $10,000 to $2,500 so people can drive an electric car, or $5,000 so they can drive a hybrid. It just doesn't work. And this is where, again, environmentalists mislead us from real solutions to real problems. By the way, um, this was surprising analysis for me. This is public transportation, US heavy rail system, 157 grams of carbon emissions per passenger mile. Far more than a cellulosic GM Volt, which GM is introducing in the year 2010. Shocking. So the other question I get asked is, how much land? And where will biomass come from? Turns out, our demand by the year 2030, if you take conservative assumptions, at 110 gallons per acre, uh, I'm sorry, 110 gallons per ton of biomass. The legend is wrong. And I already know people working on 150 tons of bio, uh, uh, gallons per ton of biomass. But even at the 110 assumption, we need 1.3 billion tons of biomass 10% of it can easily come from waste. Whether it's hog waste or municipal sewage from New York City, it can be converted into biofuels if it has carbon. Municipal sewage, municipal organic waste, that's a relatively small number. It's a small fraction of our organic waste. But here's the surprise. Most agricultural land in this country in fact, all agricultural land, essentially, unless it's mandated to not to be allowed to be barren, stays barren between the month of September and March. The only people who grow anything are people who are forced to grow something, like in Maryland, because nitrogen during the winter rain leaches from the land into Chesapeake Bay, 
now you're allowed, required to grow biomass crops in the winter to prevent runoff. Well, that biomass could provide the bulk of what we need to replace all our imported oil. Without an additional acre of land, details um, are on my website again. Forest excess waste, uh, excess waste. This is forest waste that's harvested today and left on the floor, often decomposes into methane, a terrible greenhouse gas, worse than carbon dioxide. You do those calculations, and I won't go through it. You need zero land to replace all our gasoline. You can assume different scenarios. And even in the most conservative assumptions, the amount of land needed, if we do it right, is small. Here's the surprising part. Winter cover crops is the linchpin of this analysis. And winter cover crops would improve the ecology of summer crop growing. You would need less nitrogen because it hasn't run off. Because you haven't killed the microbial communities that thrive in root systems that die during the winter because the land is left barren. Because you won't lose topsoil as it runs off barren plowed land. So, there are many answers. Let me switch. In, in all this is on my website and extensive papers, I write a lot. Um, I do my own analysis, and that's probably the only thing you'll find that's different. I only ask, don't disagree with my conclusions. Just disagree and tell me which assumption you disagree with, because they're all explicitly stated. People always say it can't be but they can't tell me which specific assumption they disagree with. Because if the assumptions are right, the conclusions are right. So, let me talk about how we approach this world, because we don't approach it as green. We attack manageable and mater but material problems. What's, what's an unmanageable problem? Convincing the world to get out of SUVs. I'm not about to change human behavior. I'm glad other people are trying. That's great. I support it. Personally, it's not worth my time because I don't believe humans change very easily. What's an immaterial problem at the other end? Geothermal is a wonderful technology, great source of electricity, completely unscalable. You can make a little bit of money at it, but you can't replicate it enough to replace coal. It's not a material solution. Two, I don't invest, and you'll see our portfolio in just a second, in any technology that can't achieve unsubsidized market competitiveness within a short period of time. Because, you know, we can get San Franciscans to buy anything, pay extra. <laughs> Upper middle class Germans can pay 40 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. But it's irrelevant to climate change till we get India and China to adapt it till the technology meets what I call the Chindia price. And the Chindia price is where it's cheaper than this fossil alternative, so India and China adapt it, and then we don't have a climate change problem. We will have low carbon technologies adapted by the world without forcing anybody to do it. Scale is also important. I mentioned the geothermal example. Hybrids don't scale. Wind doesn't scale. Wind's great. It can make 10% of our power, maybe 15%. But that's irrelevant to replacing the 50 or 80% that we need to replace and be cheaper than fossil so people actually do it. Of course, we won't start fusion experiments because they cost $20, $20 billion. That's a limitation of our startup world. But most importantly, some technologies have increasing cost with scale. Corn ethanol is a classic example. If you're using food crops and you start using the bulk of it, prices will go up. Other technologies, as we've seen in Silicon Valley, have declining cost with scale. And we have to pick the right technologies. So, 
that's what people think of clean tech or green tech or whatever they want. That's not what we are investing in. The new green, in my view, is engines, a $200 billion market, lighting, appliances, batteries, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, cement, water, glass, by the way, bioplastics. By the way, we've invested in every single one of these categories. It's not about alternative energy, it's about mainstream societal infrastructure. It's about power generation, not at the fringe, but competing with coal. So, we have what we call a couple of wars, the war on coal. I'll focus on a couple, utility scale solar. Rooftop distributed solar is a great investment opportunity. We have an investment there. It'll grow 30% a year for the next 10 years and be a great market. But it will not replace coal anytime in the next decade or two. And if I've learned anything, that you can't predict past a decade or two anyway. Now, geothermal is not scalable, but enhanced geothermal is. So we are putting all our effort on enhanced geothermal, creating geothermal wells where no geothermal wells exist, because the Earth's heat on which geothermal wells rely is everywhere. In fact, my favorite project is there's a coal power plant, believe it or not, uh, that feeds the capital in in Washington, you can drill a ge geothermal well, an enhanced geothermal well, right there on the same plant and supply 100% renewable power. It can be done almost anywhere. It's only a question of whether you have to dig three kilometers under or six kilometers or 10 kilometers to access that heat. That technology is worth working on, even if it's risky, because it's a solution at a large scale. Um, efficiency, electrical efficiency, we're doing a lot in lighting, batteries, motors, homes, engines, appliances, pumps. I want to convince you that this is not about alternative energy. We're investing in oil, and I'll talk about this more, so I'll skip past it. The fourth leg is material. Now, I told you coal and oil with the two big culprits, cement and steel, with the others. In fact, we're working on three of the four largest culprits. Steel is the only one we haven't found a way to crack yet. And I like to say that because every time I say we haven't learned how to do it, somebody always comes up and says, hey, try this. Um, it's like throwing a challenge out there. We have a lot of companies in this area, and I'll come back to some of them. But these efficiency companies are worth talking about. Because if you do a light bulb, that's 10 times more efficient. And we have three separate efforts to do indoor lighting, outdoor lighting, and specialized lighting, 10 times more efficient than the current solution. If you do better motors, if you do better batteries, we can dramatically cut electricity consumption, maybe in half. And if we do, we have a much smaller problem to solve that's much more easily solvable. Same thing with appliances. We're doing a number of engines. Transonic was mentioned. Um, it alone is attempting to double the efficiency of the internal combustion engine by inventing a new kind of ignition system. Most people think there's only auto ignition or spark ignition. That's all we've known for the last 100 years. They really have a clever innovation around that. Now, whether they achieve their target or not, and I expect they will, somebody will, because EcoMotor is trying to do the same. And so is Tula. And if somebody succeeds, we cut worldwide transportation fuel consumption in half because these are very low cost technologies. That's why the black swan model works, because somebody will invent it. I'll come back to the oils, and I know I'm 
running out of time. Let me talk about materials. Calera is doing a cement that's carbon negative. A ton carbon negative instead of a ton carbon positive for regular cement. At today's price of carbon in Europe, today's price of carbon, they could give the cement away for free and make tons of money. Free cement at their doors, no marketing costs. Nobody would build a road with 12, 12 inches of cement. They'd just make it 48 inches. It would re replace asphalt. The only reason asphalt is used is it's cheap. The maintenance costs are so much higher. Building, building would be done differently. Water, water is a huge problem. We, uh, we're innovating in those areas. I won't go into that. But let me give you a couple of examples. And I want to finish very quickly. This is plain old mirrors shining light onto that cube. You look from underneath, it looks sort of like that. That heat there, this little magnifying glass you used as a kid to burn paper, generates steam that goes into a 30-year-old steam turbine. In fact, it can be retrofit into a coal power plant to generate steam to supplement the coal. By the way, this technology is competitive with natural gas-based power plants in California today. And natural gas is the only other fossil fuel that's considered in California. It's pretty amazing that an alternative solar is mainstream. This is next generation coal, nuclear, natural gas, old coal. The fact is, this is about market competitive technologies. Alter Rock is enhanced geothermal, geothermal. Heat exists everywhere, wells don't. They create the wells. Stion, I talked about, uh, is doing photovoltaic for distributed solar. Biofuels. People say it can't be done. They're extrapolating the past. Till two years ago, most people said it would take 10 or 15 years. And the reason was very simple. The largest project I saw was a professor at Dartmouth with two graduate students working on biofuels as one of six different priorities in three different PhD theses. Today, that same professor has between 50 and 100 engineers with experience working 80 hours a week with one priority, solve the problem. There's lots of ways to solve the problem, natural oils, which is what biodiesel is made from, like palm oil, sugars and starches, that's corn and sugar cane, algae, biomass, and of course, waste. The thing to realize is, as you go down that curve from vegetable oil to waste, your feedstock costs go down, and more importantly, your feedstock availability goes up. Only thing is, technical difficulty goes up, but that's an easily solvable problem. That's what we in America know how to do well. It's perfectly matched. Almost everybody is operating up there. This is where we operate. So just in the last two years, there's so many different technical and chemical, sorry, pathways that we've invested in. Just one little firm. We're only about three people investing in energy. So, Mascoma can in fact convert wood chips, which they're working on. By the way, hundreds of paper mills in this country going out of business, shutting down hundreds of jobs for every one of those paper mills. Every governor wants employment. Most of that feedstock already there can be converted into fuel. Well, Range Fuels looked at that process. It's, uh, Mescoma has this process called uh, biochem biochemical conversion, which is what everybody talks about. They changed it by eliminating most of the cost of enzymes, which are the external variable. Range came along and said, we'll do something completely different. And I want to 
tell you these stories not so much to give you the specific details, but give you a sense of how innovation's happening and how people build on each other. Range said, Mescoma is doing it in this sort of way everybody's talked about, but in fact, Hitler fueled his war machine with diesel made from coal. 100% of diesel, of Hitler's machine was fueled. Coal has carbon, which is used in producing diesel. Why can't you use biomass? So they took a different approach. They said, we'll gasify the biomass the same way Hitler gasified coal, produced syngas, and then catalytically converted diesel, con Hitler converted it into diesel, we'll convert it into ethanol, and oh, by the way, it's a lot cheaper. This is a plywood plant about the size of a football flea field that's running today. We're building a $150 million plant that will be market competitive commercially next year in Soperton, Georgia. We have a 15-year unlimited supply of feedstock because there's so much of it available. Cascada came along and said, range is a good idea. They should gasify stuff. But Hitler used catalysis. Range is using catalysis. We think we can do one better. Instead of using a catalyst, we'll use a biocatalyst. They designed a bug that eats syngas, which is half carbon monoxide, half hydrogen. So our bug, using fancy synthetic biology, will convert syngas, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen into ethanol. Good idea. They designed the reactor. And then I ran into these guys in New Zealand. They said, why do you need both carbon monoxide and hydrogen? They said, steel mill flue gases. And remember I said steel mills were a big problem and we hadn't cracked it. We've cracked actually half the problem, not all of it. Have lots of carbon monoxide, so I'm gonna design a bug that actually generates its own hydrogen. So we'll have syngas and then convert it into ethanol. Now, they believe 50 billion gallons of ethanol can be produced from the flue gases of steel mills. We had six billion gallons of corn ethanol last year. This would add between 100 and 150 billion dollars of value to the steel industry far exceeding the profits of the steel business, maybe the value of the steel business. Year after year. And oh, by the way, if you want to gasify biomass, we can use that too. That's how innovation proceeds. People build on each other's ideas. So what's a liability? A flue gas would be a disaster for steel mills in the case of carbon cap and trade, becomes an asset. Amherst came along and said, in fact, Amherst was a scientist at UC Berkeley working on a malaria drug of all people, of things. Malaria drug Artemisin, which is resistant, uh, which most malaria isn't resistant to, is made in microgram quantities from plant in China. This guy said, using fancy synthetic biology, I'll take the genes from that plant that make that drug put them in a biological cell factory, and the same cells that make moonshine will all just make them make automism. Great idea, he inserted the genes, got a $42 million grant from the Gates Foundation, they're making this anti-malarial drug so people in Africa can afford it as opposed to just visitors to Africa from the West. And we said, hey, can you do the same thing and directly produce diesel? Engineer the genes, for the diesel pathways, six of the 10 steps were common. In fact, it took him six months and they were producing diesel out of the same bugs. I could go on. Jeevo's producing butanol as a fuel. And it was very simple. Butanol was made in the 1920s, but it's made very wastefully. When a cell produces butanol, it also produces all these other things. This professor at Caltech said, we can just engineer those pathways out. All that will be left is butanol. Boom. LS9 was another company that said, we'll take a completely different approach. 
This looks like a silicon circuit. In fact, it's a picture of all the metabolic pathways inside a single cell. They focus in on the metabolic pathway for storing energy, cut off all the other metabolic pathways, and they can produce diesel with 90% efficiency. Fior came along and said, oh, we got one better than all these other guys. We know we use crude. We know crude comes from biomass. It just takes nature a few million years to produce biomass before you put it in a refinery and put it in your gas tank. We think we can take biomass in a few minutes, convert it into crude. Now, I'm not saying every one of these will work, but I would guess 70 to 80% of them will work and meet their cost target to be cheaper than gasoline. So let me stop by saying we need to get to work. We need to get rid of the economists and the forecasters and the predictors of doom and gloom. We need to invent the future. I'll take a few questions. Thank you. Right, so I can't see hands, but please uh, raise your hand and I'll... Questions? Yes. What's up? Uh, hi, Vinod. Thanks for coming down to the Future Review and excellent presentation. What's something that everybody can do? I heard this year is a year that everybody talks about something to do, but doesn't really do anything, and next year's year that somebody actually does something. So what's, every, what's something that everybody in this room, can, you, know, you know, what can they do? Uh, the little things, and people tell you, do anything and everything you can. The realistic answer is most of it doesn't matter. Cheryl Crow may tell you to use one sheet of toilet paper, not two. <laughs> but it is going to be immaterial to climate change. We need big solutions. So focus on the big solutions. Uh, I've resisted putting photovoltaic cells on my roof, even though I can afford it, because I want a cost-effective solution that people in India and China will be able to afford in five to 10 years. Be rigorous in your thinking about what works and what doesn't, but most importantly, uh, influence our legislators to do the right thing. I think that is by far the most important thing we can do, not use one sheet of toilet paper. Okay, I can't see, but yes, there's a question here. Mr. Kosla, in 30 years, what percent of the world's liquid fuel demand do you believe can be supplied from biofuels or biomass, that type of thing? Probably in excess of 80%. And the reason I say 20% because we'll have specialized applications we can't wean off of. I think it's unlikely, unless we've completely f solved the carbon problem, which we might have, I think it's somewhat unlikely in that time frame, um, that we will have a price on carbon and we will be using low carbon fuels to the maximum extent possible, partly because they're low carbon, partly because they're cheaper, uh, and the legacy applications will remain, and only the legacy applications will remain. Okay, other questions? Quite audience here? Yes. Can I elaborate more on solar thermal? Most people don't know it, but there's 4,000 megawatts of solar thermal that has been contracted by utilities in the United States today. That far exceeds the volume of photovoltaics that have been contracted or installed cumulatively, if my calculations are right. So utilities are recognizing it. And it's very simple. You use mirrors, and some people use mer parabolic mirrors and raise higher temperatures and generate higher efficiency turbine, use higher efficiency turbines which operate at higher temperatures. Other people are using flat mirrors that like I showed you. Um, our thesis is 
when solar energy is free, efficiency is not important. The cost per kilowatt hour is what's important. But there will be many different approaches. Multiple approaches will be successful. Um, but it's a simple idea. And there's very little technology risk in taking mirrors to generate steam, heat and steam, and generate, use that to power turbines. And you can power a 30-year-old turbine. In fact, we bought some used turbines from long ago and you and are using them. But there's another very important factor. If you take photovoltaics, and, and uh, like I said, we invest in photovoltaics because they do have an attractive market. I'm not knocking photovoltaics. But for utility scale power to replace coal, this is the solution. You can, in fact, store steam and heat much easier than you can st store electricity. It's all measured in dollars per kilowatt hour stored. And it's $400 per kilowatt hour for electricity and $40 for steam. Which one are we going to pick? And because of that, you can provide solar power at night. You can store it for a week and supply it during a rainy week. The most places this, these plants are being put up, like in the Mojave Desert, it's sunny enough where you don't have a week of rain. Uh, it's a very promising technology. I do believe that with enhanced geothermal are very critical technologies to replacing coal. Uh, I've recent, I'm in the process of doing an analysis to see if it works in India, if it works in China, Europe, it works in the Mediterranean and North Africa. There's some geopolitical issues around relying for Europe's power on North Africa. It works very well in the Mideast, works in most parts of Africa, Latin America, and most of the US. And transmission of power a few thousand kilometers is relatively easy. You have single digit percentage of losses. Transmitting power from Arizona to Chicago, for example. Yes. Uh, my email is up there. And the website where most of this is in papers, I have a few hundred pages of writing that I've done. Spent many a 3 a.m. Uh, writing. Um, it's all up there. Yes, question in the back there. Go ahead and yell it out, and I'll try and repeat the question. In Europe, it's the European trading uh, system, uh, and around the world, it's Kyoto, I guess, that governs it. So um, you're very confident there's going to be a price on carbon. I'm very hopeful there will be, too. What's your uh, view on the path, the legislative path that takes us from here, where we're about a week away from Lieber and Warner being introduced, um, to eventually getting a, a sort of a rational price for carbon here in the U.S.? Um, you know, Lieberman Warner has a fair amount of support. Uh, I understand in the next few days, Barbara Boxer is going to introduce her own version of that bill that also has bipartisan support. One of these bills will pass under the next president. Now, both uh, Senator Lieberman, Senator Warner, and Senator Boxer are trying to get it done in this administration. So the new president has a fresh start. There's some speculation that the president will have a hard time vetoing it because he knows the next president may sil sign a more lenient bill. And many of the interests that have opposed cap and trade are now wanting this president to sign a bill rather than the next president, all three of whom support cap and trade. So I'm hopeful that'll happen. I'm sure the process will be messy. You know, think of it like the stock exchange. It used to be a pretty lawless place in the 1830s. In fact, the first bubble happened when, the, when railroads were introduced and you could offer scripts in England uh, in the 19, 1830s if you got the route between two cities to build a railroad. And then there was a bubble and burst and then new laws and regulations were put in place. And, Every few decades, some abuse of the stock market happens, and new ro rules are put in place, and it gets better and better and better. The 1933 Securities Act was the same. 1987, when the stock market collapsed, we had a set of laws introduced. We have sovereign, so uh, 
Severance, Oxley introduced recently, uh, it gets better. Uh, maybe sometimes too much better. Uh, same thing will happen with the carbon market. It'll be far from perfect, but we'll improve it over time and it'll get better. Yes. dedicated to photovoltaics or solar thermal technology. Do you believe this is a, uh, uh, an example of effective lobbying or a good sort of market catalyst for good ideas? Uh, you know, I think it's none of those. I think it's a little bit of naivete. You know, because we find prescriptive solutions, and it's a difficult problem. I mean, having talked to many lawmakers, I understand if they don't do anything, you don't get anywhere. And if they do something specific, you're too prescriptive. Uh, and it's beyond a lawmaker's ability to judge what might be coming next. When do you count an enhanced geothermal? Well, two years ago, an MIT study said, well, 20 years. Now that there's a dozen startups working on it, I actually think it's five years or less. But it's a hard prediction to make, and the alternative for lawmakers is to do nothing. So I think it is inherently a flawed process because predictions are flawed and can't be counted on. We do the best we can. We hopefully fix our problems once we know they're wrong. Uh, photovoltaics isn't a bad technology, it's a good technology. Instead of saying photovoltaics, if they just said solar, they probably didn't even know they were saying photovoltaics instead of saying solar. They thought it was the same thing. So those kind of errors happen all the time. You can't blame them. Um, there aren't enough people spending enough time educating people. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't be disheartened by that. You know, there'll be lots of zigs and zags on the path to getting there, but I do believe we'll get there. I'm gonna take one last question. Yeah, yes. David, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. one question there and one here. Hi, um, Martin Tobias. Hi, um, I understand uh, a little more now tonight about what your thoughts are on biodiesel. Uh, could you explain a little more how you think the replacement for diesel and jet fuel will happen? Because we hear so much about cellulosic and uh, cellulosic ethanol is still you know, a lower energy density than regular unleaded but could you spend a little more time on uh, diesel and so jet fuel? My, my, my fundamental issue with diesel is, first, it's made from vegetable oils. It can be made from soybean oil, palm oil, number of other oils. Uh, two problems. First, it's an expensive crop. It competes with food. But probably most importantly, I can't see how it has decreasing cost with scale. It has increasing cost with scale, and it never reaches unsubsidized market competitiveness with where oil will get to if we have competition, which will be below $50 as soon as these alternatives scale. So that's my issue with biodiesel. Having said that, most people don't realize ethanol only replaces gasoline. We still need have jet fuel and we still have diesel for heavy trucks. Um, that's why companies like Amaris and LS9 are relying on sugars produced from cellulosic material and then biologically converting those sugars into C8, C9 hydrocarbons, C12, C13 hydrocarbons. And by selecting what hydrocarbons they're converted into, you're getting either uh, jet fuel or diesel. That's one way. A second way is to find substitutes. So butanol can, in fact, be converted into a jet fuel or a diesel substitute. Um, that's a different fuel, has to be qualified. A third completely different way is the example that I gave you of thermochemical conversion of biomass into biocrude, which then has the advantage of feeding into existing refineries. It re reuses the refinery infrastructure. Most importantly, 
It is easily acceptable to the oil companies, which are a powerful force. And you don't want to fight the oil companies if you don't have to. We'll fight the oil companies if we have to. But if we can work with them and feed them a crude, they'd be very happy and we'd be very happy. Most people don't realize that well north of 80% of the oil on this planet is owned by the national oil companies, not by the private oil companies like Exxon, Shell, BP, and others. They would be quite happy instead of buying oil from Hugo Chavez or cutting a deal in Nigeria to buy crude from you, especially if it's renewable. So that's my view. I'm going to answer one last question. Yes. Yes. You know, unfortunately, I can't go into the details. Um, but, you know, it is amazing. We use two and a half billion tons of cement, many more tons of concrete because it's multiplied by adding aggregate. Two and a half billion tons of cement is produced at 1,600 degrees. Think of the energy use taking mountains and heating them up to 1,600 degrees. Then what you get is this big rock-like thing called clinker. And then you have to grind it down into cement. If you can avoid that process, it's a big if, but we will have a pilot plant running, trying this before the end of this year. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. We're just about finished here, and uh, a couple of comments. I was, uh, I was talking, this is back to the prediction business, <clears throat> the other day with our, our staff at lunch, and I was doodling on uh, the FT, and it occurred to me that you could probably make a prediction about oil pricing. And uh, I've mentioned earlier that having a consistently high oil price is about the best thing that could happen to us right now. It's, it's, it's how Vinod will make money, how his companies will make money. It's why there's so much activity in the valley. So it's a great thing for us that we have high, consistently high oil pricing right now. Painful as it is, it's perfect as an environment for investing. Uh, having said that, who wants to pay more? And uh, it occurred to me that uh, we will probably see different oil pricing based upon who wins this next election. So as kind of a throwaway for this evening, for all of you, I thought I'd share this prediction. Uh, my, my best guess is that uh, oil right now will continue to rise slightly. I think the Goldman analysts are completely wrong. They, they, they were guessing 200 bucks. I think they're completely wrong. They were just playing a game. And as the guy who guessed 100 bucks two weeks before Goldman did last time, I have some authority here. So uh, my guess is that the the price if John McCain wins this election is about average for the next year $125. And that means it goes up a little more and then it comes back and, and averages at that point at $125. I think the price if Barack wins or our Democrat wins, put it that way, is probably about $95. So our, one can make an interesting argument that there will be a real cost a true cost, economic cost, that's kind of hidden in this election. I haven't seen anyone discuss this yet. But the cost per barrel, I think, will be different based on who wins this election. So um, in any case, I hope you all have a great time together this week. Do great things, make new friends, and we'll see you soon. Early in the morning tomorrow. Thank you.